Very excited to be here today and talk to all of you about OSTIF, the Open Source Technology Improvement Fund, and some of the cool work we're doing. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here today. Everyone watching from home on the live stream, obligatory, hi, mom. <laughs> She's watching, so had to do that. Also, our social media and PR intern, Nicolette, is going to be live tweeting, and um, we'll be taking questions as well. So if you have any questions that you just got to get down right away, feel free to send them over um, at OSTIF official. That's O-S-T-I-F and the word official. We did bake in time for the end to do a Q&A, and we'd be happy to answer questions. So if you have any, have some ready. OK, perfect. OK, yes. Yeah, so today we're going to explore OSTIF's cost-effective and impactful model for improving open source technology using a case study approach. We're briefly going to go over what OSTIF does as an organization, then dive into the case studies, which will definitely provide a lot more context as to exactly how the work is being done, and then bring it all together, and then again, take questions at the end. So to start off, OSTIF, as I've mentioned before, is the Open Source Technology Improvement Fund. We're a nonprofit organization founded in 2015 and are 501c3 verified, which means all donations to OSTIF are tax deductible. What OSTIF does is connect open source security projects with much needed funding and logistical support. And again, the case studies will illustrate a little bit better what exactly that means. And how do we do that? We have corporate sponsorships, which we will go in at the go over at the end as well, go over some of the tiers of how that works. Very happy to say private internet access is one of those sponsors, as well as direct public support. We have a Patreon account and have a page on the website dedicated to donations of all different methods. So the mission is to strengthen the internet for everyone. There's definitely that goodwill factor that we are doing this um, for the good of everybody, which is very consistent with what's seen in the FOSS community. All right. So as I mentioned, we're going to be doing a couple case studies. Each case study is going to include a situation and trend where we'll go over some of the things that we see out there, and then we'll go over OSTIF's approach to this problem, compare the two, and then um, we'll take it from there. So diving right in, the first case study we look at, something that you see a lot in the media and news, and uh, as everywhere is data loss and theft. We have a couple well-known examples, Yahoo in 2013, in which three billion account credentials were stolen. Home Depot a year later in 2014, 56 million debit credit card numbers stolen. Office of Personnel Management, OPM, all of you stateside are probably well aware of this. Um, 4.2 million personnel files and digital fingerprints stolen. And Equifax, as of last year, 143 million records stolen. So the trend that we see with that, with Yahoo, it was related to malware, related to Java, which contains open source versions. Cost of the breach was around $350 million. With Home Depot, again, we see malware, improper credential use, and network segregation. Cost of breach of around $333 million. With Equifax, it was a vulnerability in open source Apache struts, patched months before this breach occurred. Going back to Cliff's talk about the importance of patching, the cost of that breach, around $439 million. So going into OSTIF's approach, one of our first big proof of concept moments and iterations of our model to improve open source software was the 26, 2016 audit of Veracrypt 1.18, which is a very good encryption tool for encrypting files and in even entire operating systems. We coordinated the audit that was then performed by Quark's lab in Paris. And what we found and what came about was the removal of unsafe enc um, encryption implementation, as well as the removal and replacement of unsafe libraries and lastly, it fixes to a new bootloader implementation. So the result of that is 
more secure software, more secure encryption and protection of data. We have a reduced risk horizon for leaks and protection because we can never say we completely can mitigate a risk, but we can do what we can to reduce the risk horizon associated with it. And better protocols means software is safer, reducing possibility of data loss occurring. So to get an idea, we'll compare the two. Uh, we'll look at the average cost of a data breach, which according to 2018 report was around 3.86 million. And I know you might be thinking that number might should be higher, but it's just a testament to how many of these incidents happen, a lot of them to smaller and mid-sized companies. And so the cost of the Veracrypt audit, 3.99 million. Now I know what you're thinking, that's fantastic. Um, okay, I'm getting a couple of confused looks in the audience, and you got me, I'm actually kidding. The actual cost was around $30,000, which as you can see is a fraction of 3.99 million. So going into the second case study, we look at denial or loss of service. We've talked about it a bit throughout the weekend. Um, there's probably too many to name. I uh, just picked a couple well-known examples that you might be familiar with, with Dyne in 2016, which in which major web traffic was affected, and with WordPress, with the DO, a current DOS flaw in the script uh, for WordPress sites. So the trend we see here with Dyne, um, domain name system was targeted, affecting performance of major websites. It was very memorable because Twitter was actually down, which I know to some people means that the world is ending, but thankfully it did not. Uh, we had Spotify, Reddit, Netflix, Amazon, GitHub, major web traffic was affected. And with WordPress, what we see now is an unpatched CVE leaves WordPress sites, which are about a quarter of all sites on the internet, potentially vulnerable to denial of service. So building off of the momentum and the proof of concept from the Veracrypt audit, we put together a coalition of over 30 organizations and many other individuals to keep that momentum going and coordinated the audit of OpenVPN 2.4.0 in which we, there was a correction of a pre-authentication denial of service attack as well as the correction of an authenticated user denial of service attack. And lastly, fixes to certificate and service handling and user suggestions for safer practices. So what does that mean? Well, the results again are more secure software. Again, a reduced risk horizon and uh, for denial of service and better documentation and improved technology for all. <coughs> so comparing the two again, to get an idea of what denial of, service denial of service attacks cost, according to 2017 report, around 2.2 billion. A couple high profile ones like Sony come to mind, which their entire network, operations, revenue channels are completely shut down. Cost of the open VPN audit, I'm not gonna trick you guys this time, $130,000. And this again was was performed by Quark's lab. So for the third case study, we're gonna look into something that's very popular, especially in the news and media now. We're gonna be looking at cryptocurrency and cryptocurrency losses. A Couple well-known examples, again, with Bitfinex, a lot of Bitcoin, 120,000 Bitcoin stolen. The South Korean exchange, Yapizan, had around five million stolen. And earlier this year with Bitcoin Gold, around 18 million stolen. So the trend we see here with Bitfinex, $72 million in losses due to vulnerabilities in code. With Yapizan, a loss of 37% of total assets. And with Bitcoin Gold, what is commonly being referred to as a 51% attack allowed the ledger to be falsified. And so OSIF's approach to this problem, something we actually released somewhat recently, was the 28 
2015 security audit of Monero Bulletproofs, the Monero cryptocurrency. Two reviews were coordinated, one by Quark's Lab, with whom we've established a good relationship and have done good work, and another review by Kadelsky Security. There were patches to unsafe use of environment variables and input validations, and a big finding, critical, critical bug finding, where patches to code that could knock nodes offline, effectively impacting the live chain. And so when we look at the results, two reviews, we had two entirely different sets of results, which I think is a testament to the importance of diversity in this space and the importance of having different viewpoints and different groups reviewing software. Code was validated that reduced the size of transactions by 80 to 90 percent, potentially making them that much more efficient. And lastly, as I mentioned before, with the critical bug that was patched, a bug that could lead to a denial of service or what is known as a 51 percent attack was patched. So to compare the two now, we look at total crypto losses worldwide in 2018 alone have been over a billion dollars, 1.18 billion dollars. Cost of the Monero Bulletproof's audits, both reviews cost around $70,000. And the review coordinated by Quark's Lab, which was the group that found the critical bug that was later patched, cost about 38000 which when you compare the two numbers, I had to do a little bit of scientific notation, if you all remember that, it is 3.2 times 10 to the negative 5 percent of the losses in crypto worldwide. So a very, very small fraction of that led to something that protects, led to a bug that effectively protects over a billion dollars in value as well. So I hope by looking at these case studies, we were able to illustrate some of the work that we do and the great work that we are doing. And we invite you to join the movement for better open source software. As I mentioned before, we have different sponsorship tiers. A platinum sponsorship is at least $120,000 annually, which gets a seat on the steering committee, which effectively will allow the organization to guide us moving forward with future projects and new endeavors, as well as features on all published work. Gold, which is at least 25,000 annually, which grants recognition on social media, as well as advisory council membership, which is a direct line to the OSTIF board. And lastly, we have bronze and silver, which are supporting a great cause and shout outs on social media and as well. To tell you a little bit about what we're working on now, what's coming up next, is we're very happy to announce a partnership with the Internet Bug Bounty. Originally we wanted to do essentially our own bug bounty program and thought, you know, in the spirit of FOSS and collaboration working together, essentially why recreate the wheel when Internet Bug Bounty is doing a great job with bug bounties. And it's also important because it speaks to OSTIF's mission of continuously strengthening open source software and not just being a one and done, we'll just review it and never think about it again. The Bug Bounty program incentivizes continuous review and improvement of the software. So we're very excited about that. Another thing we're working on is Unbound, the Unbound Project. Um, who here is familiar with the Unbound Project? Show of hands. Okay, great. Yeah, good amount. So Unbound is open source secure DNS, which is a important software for s a secure certificate authority, i.e. Let's Encrypt, which is an organization that we are in talks with and are looking to work with in the near future. This is definitely not comprehensive. We have a lot of other things um, in the works. Um, this year we coordinated a review of OpenSSL as well. Um, we published results for the pseudo number, pseudo random number generator. That's always a tongue twister for me. 
a review of that as well as a review of um, the implementation of TLS 1.3 in the OpenSSL software. And that's just to name a few. We're definitely working on a couple other things as well and moving down the pipeline. Also, just keep moving forward. Um, I realize that this takes a very uh, strong upper lip, a tough chin. It's a lot of waiting to hear back from people and it takes a lot of patience. And it's definitely not a simple process. Um, but we keep moving forward. We keep pushing forward. Um, spread the word and network. So I want to just thank Crystal and everyone from Freenode Live again um, for allowing us to be here and talk to all of you fine people today. And as well as staying true to the mission of improving open source software for all. So with that, thank you very much. I'm going to invite the founder of OSTIF, Derek Zimmer, onto stage with me. And we're going to take uh, some time to answer questions. So again, thank you so much. And we'll do some questions now. Any questions to start off? Steven? <laughs> Your mic's good, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it obviously takes quite a lot of money um, in comparison to individuals. Like a corporate level of money here would fund a lot more. What kind of tactics do you have when dealing with large corporations um, who are obviously using these open source software solutions, which could be reviewed? That's a great question. Do you want to take that? Uh, it's interesting because there's multiple philosophies, especially in this community, behind how much corporations support open source software and what's the right amount and what you, wh what should you essentially be doing, right? Um, we, we approach a lot of companies. I mean, probably every company in this room we've tried to contact at some point. Um, and the way that we try to reel in interest from corporate donors is we allow them to get directly involved in the process. So if they have specific open source software that they're involved with, that they're concerned about the security of, they can get on our steering committee and pretty much plead their case for us to uh, look at specific projects that they're interested in. And any leftover funds are then used for all of the other projects. I mean, we've had, I think, 55 projects this year approach us for support and we simply don't have the budget to help everyone. So uh, building that corporate community is a big, big part of what I do day in, day out. Yeah, and if, and if I could chip in too, um, yeah, it's certainly not easy. They, they don't exactly have a direct line to the CTO or <laughs> something like that to approach. Um, one thing that's worked well is the networking piece. Um, just getting the word out, talking to people, and seeing who they know, who they have in their network. Um, but one thing that has been nice, as we do, as we have developed a track record and um, are doing some great work, is having more projects approach us as well, um, because we definitely offer some benefits over some of the other organizations that do similar uh, work in this space. Um, one thing that's worked really well is our commitment to transparency. So we are very open about where all of our money goes, um, where it comes in from, um, what it's going towards again, as well as what we're up to. Uh, we have our transparency blog on the website where, you know, if you want to know what we're up to and what we've been doing for the last three years, you literally could go down our, the archives and know exactly um, what we've been doing. So. I think those two pieces ha have helped a lot as well, um, especially because when corporations and organizations, they want to know that they're working with somebody who is transparent and will produce results. And so that's definitely what we're trying to uh, build and communicate to them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. get involved in perhaps filling the gaps in some places because we've been developing if I give an example um, open source software and mapping it to the requirements of government and businesses 
and sometimes some of those integrations don't fit in like when you're into sort of authentication frameworks that are common in businesses um, would you get involved in actually filling that gap or is it just auditing existing products so are we talking about something specific like FIPS or um Okay, um, it, it's definitely something that we would we would take a look at if we uh, if you just sent some information our way. Um, we are interested in helping the entire community. Um, these are our largest projects, but we work on a lot of other smaller things too, and we do a lot of work around things like uh, compliance helping open source projects find ways to file all the paperwork so they can accept donations and be tax exempt. And uh, we help them with their fundraising and things like that. As a matter of fact, I think uh, the Tor project just contacted us recently to see how we handle cryptocurrency because they work in the same jurisdiction we do. And they wanted to know, you know all of the legal hurdles that we had to jump to get through that. So uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're interested in helping any way we can and our goal is to one, cut through the bureaucracy that open source projects have to deal with because, um, for example, Let's Encrypt came to us with their issues with Unbound. And um, they told us, you know, we're a team of 18 engineers. We're really well funded, but we don't want to deal with any of these issues. We just want to be able to bring it to you and you guys can solve the problem. And uh, yeah, that's, that's basically where we're at, is we're, we're just here to help the projects succeed in any way we can. Yes, and, uh, and if I could jump in as well. So the security audits have been a very <coughs> impactful way to directly improve the software. And when we started, we definitely had the idea of, like Derek was saying, to help out in any way we can and had these goals and found that the security audits were a very direct way to improve to directly improve the software um, but yes we're, we do help in many other ways as well because a lot of the open source projects they're mostly run by volunteers and they're mostly just developers engineers and they need that kind of advocate that that entity to kind of back them and help them in any way and and that's what we're developing OSTIF into becoming mm -hmm. thank you great question Okay, we have a question on the back. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so do you folks have any connections to the core infrastructure initiative out of the Linux Foundation, and do you see yourselves as partnering with them in any way? Uh, <laughs> I know, it's complicated. <laughs> yeah, uh, I actually founded OSTIF because the core infrastructure initiative was not transparent enough. That, that was literally the reason that I got off my butt and did all the work for this. Um, question was, do you know how to find their founders? Do we know how like to funders, find their funders? Sorry, my apologies. Their funders. Uh, we've actually contacted many of their funders, but we usually don't hear back unless we have a direct line to someone. So uh, networking also helps us tremendously as well. So if you guys are interested in what we're doing and you know someone somewhere, uh, just drop them my email and uh, we'll be in touch. Yes, our emails are very simple. Amir, A-M-I-R, at ostiff.org. And Derek is Derek at ostiff.org. Um, do you know the funders? <laughs> Miss who asked the question. Yeah, I can't see. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Leslie. Yes, and hey, Leslie. I asked the question. Yeah, and do you um, know the funders? Not that I'd admit publicly okay. in this wonderful <laughs> <Okay. laughs> room. But yes, hey, I, I do. had to ask. Sometimes. You know, no, like, <laughs> so the answer is sometimes. Um, yeah. but, but I also, if it's not and inappropriate use of this time, I would also um, urge you that there are a number of folks who have recently become wealthy from working at, at companies like Facebook, Google, et cetera, who have mm -hmm. a, a deep interest in free software, and that was what attracted to these employers in the first place. And I'm wondering about your opportunities to fundraise through those channels, and I would love to talk to you more about that not right now. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, yes, couldn't agree more. Um, one thing I personally was tentatively planning as, um, given I have family in the Bay Area, was essentially doing like a, a little road show, going out and meeting with as many people as I possibly could to tell them about the great work we do. And, um, but that is definitely a, a great idea because one thing that we've noticed is it's very hard to communicate 
the benefits of what OSIF does to a non-technical audience, uh, especially to um, like a, a average Joe, as they say. Um, lots of times you start talking about open source software and all, all this and you just see their eyes glaze over. But um, thankfully the technical audiences are much more receptive, so we'd like to continue that. And as we grow and as open source in general becomes more popular and more people learn about it, that should hopefully help um, get into those markets as well. So thank you, that was a fantastic suggestion. Um, we still have time for questions, right? I think I went kind of fast, so okay. Any other questions? Let's hear them. Ignorant question. Um, I missed the start of your talk, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. And I don't know what what size organization are you and if you have a mission statement, ha what would it what would you say it was? Sure. Uh, we're a small organization actually. We only have six employees. All of us are volunteers. Um, none of us take a salary. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, we're we're very small. Um, as our budget grows, we would take on more work and eventually work full time and maybe have to take some sort of salary if it were to replace my day job. But uh, right now, we're just volunteers doing what we can to help the community. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, and yes, our we have on the website we we have a relatively simple mission statement um, saying that we're building and improving powerful security tools to protect information around the world. It's kind of like a catch-all statement, but um, the website has a lot of good information that communicates mm -hmm. uh, you know, exactly what it is we do as well. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna start calling people out if I don't get any questions. <laughs> Okay, I believe we have time for one more question. Sure. Of course. <laughs> Please take this with the spirit of uh, respect that is intended, but Amir, thank you for giving the first talk I've ever seen that I enjoyed and completely <laughs> believed given by someone in a suit. <laughs> you rock! <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Okay, wonderful. Oh, okay, one more then. Uh, if you could order any piece of software under OSIF, what would you order? Ooh. Oh, man. That's a tough one. Huh? Oh, yes. If we could audit any piece of software right now, what would it be? Uh, hmm. I would say probably WordPress.org. <laughs> That's what 50% of all websites <laughs> now not manage that well. I I think that that would definitely be something we would want to look at. Yes, and there's definitely no shortage of projects that need help. It's just a question of how can we make the biggest impact we can with the resources we have at the moment. So um, some people who say, you know, oh, well, there are other organizations out there doing this kind of stuff. Well, it's like, well, that's because there's no shortage of demand for it. You know, we need, we need more resources, and so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would. But WordPress is a good one. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm definitely very interested in WordPress and the supporting software for WordPress. You know, the the Lamp Stack, as we were talking about, would definitely need a look all the way through. Um, and uh, it's very important as well because we are coming at it as an a neutral advocate, and it's not you know open source projects auditing themselves, nor is it just some company sweeping through and saying, hey, this is all good. And uh, so we, we try to work with the project. If we find the same problem recurring over and over and over again, we work with them to try to mitigate the issue and eliminate it from ever happening again for that project, so. Yeah. All right, well, thank you all again. Um, really appreciate the time today. And uh, yeah, have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Thank you both.